this evening. And so Psalms chapter number 37, and the title of tonight's message is Trust in the Lord. Oftentimes it's easier said than done to, to put trust in anything, but one thing we can be sure of is if we put trust in the Lord, He will take care of us. Psalms chapter number 37, if you've got your place and you're able to, would you stand for the reading of the word? Alrighty, uh, verse number one says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgments as the noonday. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your many blessings. Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity, Lord, to break your word open, Lord. And I pray that you would come down here and meet with us this evening, Lord, more than anything. That you'd send your Holy Spirit down here. You'd fill this place with your spirit, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. If there's anything that I need to be cleansed of, Lord, that would hinder me from receiving the spirit, Lord, I pray that you cleanse me of it. Hide me behind the cross that it be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So if we study... Psalms chapter number 37, it would appear that it's written as a time of reflection over some of David's life events. Some chapters we can directly connect back to what was going on in David's life, but as you read through this, this, this chapter appears to be a, a, from a mature standpoint in David's life. And if we reflect on where God has brought us from and all the things that's happened along the way, we'll surely see the changes that have happened in our life. And as we, start to tr- as we start to look at trusting in the Lord, there are some things that will help us develop a better understanding of exactly what it is that we need to know to trust Him. See, we tend to trust God situationally. We tend to say that it's easier to trust God when we feel that He's present, when we know that God is going to be in that situation. But we have a harder time trusting when we're unsure of His presence being around. And I got to thinking about this, and I really want to illustrate an example of this, so Xander offered to help me out here. How many of y'all have ever seen a trust fall? Anybody ever heard of it? Trust fall. Come up here and stand there for me. So you obviously, you see that I'm back here to catch you, right? So I just want you to fall backwards if you trust me. See, I got you. Now stand back up. All right? Now I want you to look at me the whole time. Don't take your eyes off me, all right? Do you still trust me? You trust me to catch you? You do. You don't? Why? Why? So because I'm far away, you don't trust me. What if I told you to trust me like you would trust God? Would you do it? Okay, well, then I'm going to ask you to trust me like you trust God and fall back. I was looking at you. (laughs) Listen, hey, come here. Come here. So he was supposed to catch you, by the way. (laughs) That was planned. Now... If we look at this, okay, when we trust God, when we just learn to lean back on Him, you saw how easily Xander fell back when I'm standing right there. But when I come far away from Him and you feel like He's not, you feel like I'm not close to you, you don't think that I'm going to grab you and be able to catch you, right? Okay, you can go back to your seat. See, trusting God's easy when you know He's right there. Trusting God is easy when you can feel that His Holy Spirit's presence is right here presently with you at the moment. You find it hard when you don't think he's there but what you can know is to trust God just like in this situation that we've demonstrated here it it shows us an example there are two kinds of trust there is a trust that's situational and there is a trust that's unconditional if you unconditionally trust God you're going to fall back on God and not worry about what's going on around you but you're going to trust that he's there and that he's got you in his hand and that's what we're looking at here tonight so it may seem as though We could trust God on the mountain. Anytime we get up on top of the mountain, we could trust God that he's going to be there. But when we get down in the valley, sometimes it feels like, hey, we're all alone. God's still there in the valley, too. I'll, I'll simply submit it this way. We have a problem with unconditional trust. We have a problem sometimes letting go of our own issues of trust and just giving everything to God. We often find ourselves trusting when our situation favors us. Hey, too many times we say hard times have come. 
I don't think I'm going to trust right now. Hey, I'm going to trust the Lord if my bank account is right right now. I'm going to trust the Lord if I've got health in my body. I'm going to trust the Lord if my kids have perfect health and my house situation is in order. We've got to stop putting God in a box and learn to fully trust Him and just let go and give everything that we have to God. We surrender everything we have to Him. I'm, he's the greatest thing that we have to fall back on. And I'm not saying a fallback plan like, hey, I'm going to go my own way and if all else fails, I'm going to fall back on God. No, fall back on God before you start walking down your path because God's going to carry you along the way. As I studied this passage of Scripture, one thing was very clear to me. We have trust issues. Me, you, the next door neighbor, the people down the street, the people in the next country, the people all across the globe. We have trust issues. So to understand better how to trust God, he's given us this book, our Bible, that's full of examples that, as well as instructions. God doesn't leave anything to chance. He says, here it is. He lays it all out. Trust me. This is my word. Take it for what it is. That being said, we're going to dive into our message. First point is fret not because of evildoers. That very first verse says, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the works of iniquity. What a strange way to start that chapter. Fret not because of evildoers. So there are two excellent questions here that, that came to mind when I was reading this. And one is, why would a child of God worry about evil? And the other is, why would a child of God envy those workers of iniquity who commit such atrocious acts? And these were the answers that came to mind here. Evil is always going to be against you. No matter what's going on, you're always going to have evil against you. When you're working for the Lord, it's going to happen. It's bound to come. David seemed like he had one evil after another falling against him. Men like Paul had people stone him, and he still got up and he went on and preached the gospel. You think about Jesus. Jesus had people mock him. He had people spit on him. He had people say all manner of crazy things to him, and yet he still kept on going, even obedient unto death on a cross to die for our sins. He never stopped the work of the Father. We could find many examples in our Bible. Anytime good is present, though, you can count on the fact that evil will be there to try to counteract it. Evil doesn't play fair. It doesn't put on kid gloves. It's going to attack you just like Satan's attacking you right there in that present moment. And you've got to be ready to trust God that God's going to take care of you in that situation. It's simply Jesus and the saved versus Satan. This is a story as old as time itself. Satan knows that he has but a little time to destroy humanity. He's got this small window and he's doing everything he can to get us to take our faith and trust out of God. And what's important there is that we keep on going. We understand that we're not alone. Any child of God can and will be attacked for no reason at all, simply for no other explanation other than they're a child of God. Hey, Satan can attack us anywhere, anytime. So we see the purpose of fret not thyself because of evildoers. Evil workers of iniquity are always going to be around us and we must press on. And we're going to see this later on in the message, but we come to find that we don't need to worry what evil is going to be upon us and that he'll handle things. You know, if God were to open our eyes right now and just show us everything that's around us spiritually going on and the battle that's raging, we would be amazed. We'd be blown away at all the things that are going on around us. One thing that you can immediately find peace in as God says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. God wants us to stop worrying about evil and start worrying about a right relationship with him. We also see that evil doesn't discriminate. Hey, evil doesn't pick sides. There are the lost that are out there that are going to work for Satan, but there are also Christians out there that fall into that trap of evil. And when that happens, you can see that there's no side that's been picked. Uh, you know, if you're saved, we're on the same team. We're all on the same team if we're saved. If you're not saved, my prayer is that you come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior before it's too late. I have no hate for anyone. The only thing that I hate is sin, and that's what God hates. Sin coming from a Christian should immediately be repented of and apologized for. Christians should never want to see harm done to another Christian. We should never want to, uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ that they, they be hurt by us or by an evil deed that we've done. And when it comes down to evil, a Christian who has not been reading their Bible like they should or praying like they should or even living like they should, you might see that this Christian can easily fall victim to evil and not only fall victim to it, but be a partaker of it. We also see in verse 1, don't envy evildoers, workers of iniquity. 
You know, it may seem like evildoers have this great life and that nothing's ever going wrong with them and they seem to be, you know, just living on cloud nine. Nothing bad ever happens to them. Everything bad always happens to me because nothing bad ever happens to them. That's the mentality and the mindset that we have. But we don't do evil for evil. We don't retaliate with evil. You know how we should answer that? We should pray. We should talk to God on their behalf. God will deal with evildoers. What you come to find is that, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I struggled with this thought. Because when I looked at this, I said, why would I envy someone who works iniquity? Why would I envy someone who wants to be evil and sin? And what I've come to find is, is that people envy that, that all is well in this evildoer's life. And all, all seems to be going right for them. And here you are worrying, anxious, stressed out, don't know what's going on, and you're trying to do everything right by God. God will deal with evildoers. God will reward evildoers a just reward for what they've done. And God will deal with Christians as well who wish to do evil. Things never go unpunished even though they seem to. Think about this for a moment. A picture of heaven. John the Revelator showing us a moment in time to come. He saw that the books were open. God's a record keeper. God keeps records. Now I'm here to say right now today that when you are saved, born again, your record is clean and there is nothing on that that God is going to have in his books when you get to heaven. But it will be the evil, the, the, the lost people who are doing evil there. Uh, the great white throne judgment will be a time of rewards. And we know it as wages or payment handed out for evil and sin. It's worth noting that a saved person that does evil, you know, God may take their health. God may take something that they've got going on in their house that uh, they might allow the plumbing to go bad, your cars to, to have something wrong with them, or he could go as far as to take us out of this world. So it's important that we depart from evil and do good when we think about these verses here. The old saying goes, two wrongs don't make a right. What seems like an injustice should never be rewarded with evil. That is exactly what the scripture tells us, and God says that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God also tells us in verse 2 of chapter 37 that they shall soon be cut down like the grass and withered as the green herb. God's going to deal with those that do evil. So as verse 1 states, we don't fret because of evildoers. So we're to stop worrying about evil. Stop worrying about what's going on around us and worry about trusting God and putting a relationship and everything we got into trusting Him. And our mission, which is to go out and tell this lost and dying world, about Jesus and warn them about hell that's coming. That leads us to point number two. We trust in the Lord. So if we look at verse three, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee thy desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. So we see here right away, trust in God has three parts here to consider. We're doing good, we're delighting in the Lord, and we're committing your, our way unto the Lord. And one thing to note as we look through these verses is that each part has a reward behind it. Each part of trusting God, God says, I'm going to reward you with something here. So we do good because we trust in the Lord. If there's one thing that we should learn quickly is to do good works. Do good for others. When we, when we think about this, we should always be wanting to do good and avoid evil. We're departing from that evil that we just talked about a second ago that we may glorify our Father which is in heaven. Trusting God means that we're doing good and attempting to do good works for God's glory. Everything should be on the up and up. I think of Joseph. Joseph trusted God, and yet at every single turn, Joseph had issues, one right after another. And Joseph kept on going for God because he knew that God was faithful, and he trusted God through all of that. Joseph had everything prosper in his hands because of this. Everything he put his hands to, the Lord blessed because he trusted the Lord. He gave it all to God. Never once in the story of Joseph do you see that he stopped trusting him. He just kept on going. And then we, in the end, we see that Joseph was rewarded each and every time for this. You know, you think about a great God that we serve. You think about God that shows us a man like Joseph, who shows us the rewards and the things that if we just do these things in our life, we trust him and we give everything we got to him, that God will prove faithful. God will show us we serve a great and gracious God. If you feel led to do something, if you feel led to go help somebody out, go help them. 
if the Holy Spirit's leading you to do it, especially go help them because you're doing good and you're showing the glory of God through that. Hey, I don't want nothing for this. I just want to give you a track. I just want to talk to you about God, tell you how good he is. There are things that we can do when we're led by the Holy Spirit to go help and do a good deed. And God blesses our obedience. All we have to do is follow. God will provide for our needs, and we can be down to our very last penny. And if God says, hey, I want you to give your last dollar, you got to do it. You know why? Because God can take that dollar away from you just as easy as he said, hey, I'm going to bless you for doing what I said. God can cause those things to happen like you have a car problem or you have something going on with your house. So we trust that God's going to take care of us. And when that last dollar leaves our hand, if that's what he tells us to do, we do that in obedience and faith that he's going to give it back to us. There's an untold number of stories of Christians who have done what they felt led to do by God, and they get a check in the mail, come back to them for something that they didn't even know was going on. Hey, I've gotten checks in the mail that have been three or four years down the road. Didn't know what they were for, didn't know where they came from other than the company that sent it. Don't know even why that they were sent at that particular time, but God will bless, and sometimes it's further down the road. It's not necessarily now. Not all good works are monetary. Some good works could be as simple as you going to help a brother move or a sister move from, from one place to another. Or maybe someone needed a card in the mail or a visit in the hospital. No matter what good deed done, do them all trusting that you'll reap what you sow. If you sow good, you'll reap good. If you sow evil, you're going to reap evil. Remember that what you do has an impact on how your life is. And notice that when we do good here, that we'll dwell and we'll be fed. God's always going to provide for our needs. Don't hold back from doing good. Trust that even if it comes down to your last dollar or your last bit of effort, that you're going to give it and give it all with the glory of God in mind. Trust Him and do good always. Which brings us to delight in the Lord. We delight in the Lord because we trust Him. Verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. If you never get any joy out of serving God, if you never get any joy out of this Christian life, we need to hold on to this here. Because you need to revisit your salvation. Because this Christian life that we have is supposed to be joyful. We're not supposed to go around with long faces all the time and just be upset and woe is me and man, the world's against me and there's all this evil going on. We should have joy in our life. Listen, I'll never question if you're saved or not. But I'm telling you now that if you don't have joy down in your heart because the Lord is stirring you up, then you, need, you may need to go revisit your salvation. We have plenty to be excited about. I don't know about you, Brother Charles, but I know that my Savior died for me on an old rugged cross. I know that He saved me from a place called hell. Get happy, child of God. Let's be happy because that word there, child of God, that little phrase, that should mean something to us. That should stir us up inside that we have a God who calls us His child, that we're His own. Are you redeemed? Are you redeemed here tonight? Shout praises to God if you're redeemed. Are you saved? What did He save you from? He saved you from a place called hell. That's something to be excited about. It's something to get happy about and have joy in our life because God has taken us out of this place that is so horrible that the torments of this place would make anybody not want to go if they could just see it for five seconds. He saved you from your sins. I thank God that as I stand here before you today, I am a clean slate. No matter what I've done, no matter what gets brought up, that Satan tries to kick in my face, and no matter what kind of mud he wants to throw on me, I will tell you this now, God sees me as a clean slate, covered by the blood. When he sees me, he the blood. My sins are cast as far as the east is from the west, cast into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again. Boy, that's something to have some joy about. Your sins were as dark as night, and yet when he plunged you into that crimson flow, you came up clean, brand new, all those guilty stains are gone. The worst thing you've ever done has been washed away. And Christian, let me tell you, you delight in the Lord your God and you'll have more joy than you'll know what to do with. Do everything that you do in this life with joy in your heart. Hey, if I'm going to serve God, let me do it with a, a, a song of worship on my lips. Let me praise His name while I'm doing this. And it'll lift you up. It'll lift your spirits. And that joy is just overwhelming. And I promise you He'll give you more joy than you can handle. This is about a mindset. I want to be happy that no matter whatever comes my way, that I'm 
going to be faithful to God and happily do it with joy in my heart. Surround yourself with happy, joyous Christians. Surround yourself with people who are going to lift you up and make you smile and make you want to serve God. And you'll see the results of delighting in the Lord. God will give us the heart, our heart's desires. Listen, if our hearts are delighting in God, we'll want what God wants for us. We'll want God's will in our life, and we want what God wants for us. If your delight is in God, your desires are going to be righteous. You'll be joyful in doing those righteous things, and your heart will want what God wants for you. Commit thy way unto the Lord. That requires trust in Him. Commit thy way unto the Lord, and trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. What are we committing to the Lord? Our own ways are sacrificed to Him that His will may prevail in our lives. We're committed to living a separated life. We're going to live a life free of worldly distractions. We're going to live a life free of the filth that we find on our devices and on our TVs. We're going to live a life free of lusting with our eyes or lusting with our hearts or idleness or idolatry or fornication, uncleanliness, hatred, wrath, strife, heresies, just to name a few. We should be careful what we place in front of our eyes. We should be careful where we allow our feet to take us to go. We should be careful what we allow our tongue to say. We should be careful what we allow our hands to do. We should totally surrender to God. And we give all to Him and we have this commitment that we're making to Him. Every part of our life is given wholly to Him. God doesn't want little bits and pieces. He doesn't want, oh, I'm going to take a piece here and oh, here I'm going to give you a piece there. And God wants us to commit wholly to Him. Everything we have, we lay it down on an altar before God. Whether that be in your prayer closet, whether that be in an old-fashioned altar, commit to God totally. Or are we just content to sit on our hands when we think about things that we ask to commit to? Hey, can we get a volunteer for something? Well, I'm just going to sit on my hands and look around. It's easy to get in that mindset. It's easy to get in that mentality of, well, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will pick up the slack. We pray that God gives us a servant's heart. Pray that God lays a burden on our heart to share in service for God. Are we content to allow others to serve and let them step up to what is needed? Commit to the work of God. Commit your life in such a way that you're ready to serve God at the drop of a hat. See, the best part about being all in for God is the reward that comes with this commitment. God brings your commitment to pass when you give it to Him, when you trust in Him. God places things on our heart, and if we're fully trusting God, God will bring these things to pass. But preacher, I just can't commit to God. My kid's got something going on right now. I can't commit to God. My job, it's got me so busy. I can't, I'm just working so many hours. But preacher, I can't go out on a bus. I can't, I can't go door knocking. I can't go visiting others. I can't go sending out letters. Well, what can we do? What can we do for God to serve Him? God has something for each and every one of us. There's a parable in Matthew that talks about talents. There are five different, uh, or excuse me, three different men who got talents. And each man were given according to their ability. And when you look at that, there was a man that got just one talent. I believe every man and woman that God has made has just one talent to do. Some have many, some have one. Ask God what it is we can do to serve with that one talent if it's just the one. So will we trust God? Will we commit ourselves wholly to Him? When you commit yourself to God and salvation. You repent of your sins and you give your life over wholly to Him. You say, Lord, I want to do what's right by You. I want to serve You. You may not know that at that very moment, but that is what you are committing. And the more you start digging into God's Word, the more you'll understand what He wants you to commit to Him. The question becomes, can you let go of all you've got and give all to God? God doesn't want those bits and pieces like I said. And God forbid we live an uncommitted life to Him. If we're a Christian, we should let everything we have in our being be given to God. Step out of our comfort zone. Step out. Step out in faith and fall into the hands of God. Trust Him 100%. 100% faith that God is going to take care of you, that you're going to make it when you give everything you got to Him. So we don't fret over evildoers, and we fully trust in God through doing good, delighting in God, and committing our ways to Him 100%. And lastly, we see the results of these things. God shall bring forth your righteousness. Verse 6 says, And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as light, and thy judgment as the noonday. 
You know, it seems like a long road to get here. It seems like a long road of commitment and trust and a long road to, to understand that we've got to let go of worrying about what evil might fall on us. We've got to commit to God. We've got to trust Him wholly. And no matter who's going to stand against you, if you're living for God and you're doing what's right, God's going to take care of you. God's going to show your righteousness. You just keep on doing what you can for the Lord and keep praying that God will keep you from that evil. This is partly why we see that we should not fret because of evildoers. And we should know when to speak our peace. We should know when to hold our silence. There are times that we need to speak out when evil is being spoken of us. And there are times that we need to hold our silence. God gives us the words to say. We trust in Him to give us wholly what it is that we need to speak at that moment and that time. And if God doesn't give us the words, it's better for us to keep silent. If God's urging you to speak, then you must speak. And David points this out just two chapters later, that his heart was hot within him while he mused. The fire was burning inside. There was something that David had to get out. And David was a man after God's own heart. David learned many lessons through his life. God knows his heart just like God knows our heart. God knows what we've done. God knows where we're at. And if we're coming from a, a place of righteousness or if we're coming from a place of evil that needs to be cleansed out of our lives. So we trust in the Lord. We don't fret about evil people that wish to do evil to us because God will bring forth our righteousness. One other thing we cannot leave undone, we see judgment in the last part of verse 6. So if you look at that, it says, Thy judgment as the noonday. He's bringing that forth. God brings forth the judgment. It's not my judgment. It's God's judgment. Because if I'm living by His book and I'm sharing His word, People mistake, judge not lest ye be judged. Because God's word is what judges. When we speak God's word, that's what people think that we're talking to them, that we're judging them. But we have what God refers to as a righteous judgment. This is what sharing the scripture with someone does when they don't line up with the scriptures. Hey, you want to witness to somebody, but they say, hey, you're judging me. I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me about my sins. That's being judgmental. That's not me. That's coming from God. So if I'm sharing what God's got, how am I being judgmental? It's not. That's the thing. We're not being judgmental there, and we need to understand that. The sad reality is, is that we have not judged them at all, but God has already judged them. Every detail, down to even the smallest one, God has passed on judgment. This world says shame on us Christians for judging how they want to live, and we're just repeating what God has. Those that are not saved will see God's judgment, and that belongs to God. That doesn't belong to you and me. The things that they've done in their life, we just try to share with them so that they can have a chance to go to heaven, so that they can have a chance to escape hell. But we let God handle the rewards for both good and evil. God will bring forth your righteousness. And I've read this chapter through so many times, I want to end with some encouragement here from chapter 37. I just want to read a few select verses. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, shalt thou diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. That's a scary place to be when you see that the Lord is laughing at you over your judgment to come. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. Verse number 20 says, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume, and to smoke shall they consume away. And in verse 23, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. That little illustration of trust that we have, that God's upholding us, we need to think about that. When we have trust issues and we have things going on that God is going to hold us up. You look at verse 25 there and it says, I have been young and am now old, yet I have not seen the righteousness forsaken nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth his seed is, he, and lendeth and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell evermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. So there's some encouragement there for us. There's some things that we can look at and, and understand that God has encouragement in that, excuse me, in that passage for us. All we have to do is trust Him. 
The question is, are we trusting him tonight? Are we giving him everything we got? Are we trusting that he's going to hold us up and that he's going to keep us from evil and we're not worried about what's going on in this battle that's raging around us? If the uh, musicians want to come up, we're going to have a time of invitation. If you have a need tonight, this altar's open. If the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart or there's something in your life that you just need to, to get with God and, and reach out to heaven and cry out to Him, this altar's open, this front pew, if you can't come down here and uh, pray on the altar, you know, the front pew's open. God deals with us. All we have to do is trust Him and God will deal kindly with us. We give Him everything we've got. We commit our ways to Him and give everything to Him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day and we thank You for Your many blessings, Lord. I pray that You would help us now in this time of invitation, Lord, and if uh, there's needs that need to be met, Lord, and people that need to pray, Lord, I pray that You'd meet with their requests, Lord, and I pray that You would help us in this time of invitation. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.